Hello and greetings from UB. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management, we are delighted you are able to join us for today's webinar presentation. My name is Christy Fields and I serve as the Director of Alumni Lifelong Engagement here at UB. And I'm also joined by my wonderful colleague, Joy Rona, who will assist in answering any questions. We are both so grateful you are able to join us for this educational opportunity. Since 1923, the UB School of Management has been developing leaders and making an impact on individuals, businesses, and communities around the world. In their mission to define the future of management, Dean Iyer has unified the school around four distinct areas of focus, business analytics, social impact of management, business of climate change, innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership. Each of these initiatives are helping to realize their vision of a world of transformational leaders and organizations who change society for the better. With that said, we are honored and excited to welcome today's featured presenter, UB alumna Susan Steffen. Susan serves as the Executive Director of the UB School of Management Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Susan leads the center's efforts to provide training and support to business owners so their businesses can be successful, grow, and contribute to Western New York's economic success. She also serves on the board of directors for Alden State Bank. And prior to joining the CEL in January of 22, she worked for Medai University, where she was an associate professor in the Department of Business, Management, and Leadership. She also served as department chair and director of the school's MBA program. Prior to her roles in higher education, she held positions in the private sector and ran an independent consulting business. Susan earned both her MBA and BS in business administration from the UB School of Management, where her passion for negotiations began. After graduating, she developed those skills through such corporate roles as purchasing and sales. She has offered negotiations training to industry and business groups and created and taught college courses in both negotiations and consensus building. Today's session will teach you the keys to negotiating success before, during, and after the deal. This dynamic presentation will give you skills that you can immediately apply to your next negotiation with a vendor, an employee, or even your teenager. Learn to negotiate with confidence and integrity and create long lasting relationships with the other side. We will leave time today during today's webinar for Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them using the question button on your Zoom taskbar and you can send those to us at any time. In addition, we'll be recording today's session and we're gonna send you all a copy within the next 24 hours. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to our featured presenter, proud UB alumna and executive director of the UB School of Management's Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, Susan Steffen. Welcome, Susan. Great, thank you. I am thrilled to be here and thank you for that nice introduction, Christy. All right, we've got a lot to get to, so we're gonna get right to it. Uh, whether you know it or not, every one of us negotiates almost every day. Whether we're closing a big deal at work, purchasing a new appliance, deciding where to meet for lunch for friends, or actually getting your kids to go to bed at a certain time. Um, my goal is to help you achieve a better outcome with less stress in all of those situations and any others that you have to deal with. In addition to showing you how to do better for yourselves, I want to press upon you the value of fair negotiations and building long-term relationships with the other party. So before we get started, I just want to read the room and get a temperature for how you guys feel about negotiations. So if you could quickly just uh, give an answer to this intro poll about how you feel about negotiating and let me know what I'm dealing with to start, that would be a big help. All right, looks like we've got a few more responses coming in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and let's see how we're doing. All right, 14% of you love negotiating. That's awesome, gets your adrenaline pumping. 68% of you do it when you have to. And then there's 18% of you who would rather get a root canal and be at the dentist's office. So that is um, not unexpected results. So I am gonna guarantee that those of you who love it, you're gonna learn a few more things that you can practice with it. 
Those of you who do it when you have to do it, you'll maybe like it a little bit more now. And those who would rather go to the dentist, at least we'll get you so that you might actually want to consider negotiating as a better outcome than going for a root canal. All right. So we are going to um, start with the negotiation process, the steps that we're going to cover today. We're going to talk first about preparation. We're going to go into negotiation itself and then the outcome and evaluation steps. Um, the single most important step that we're going to begin with is preparation. Okay, preparation is the only part of a negotiation that you actually control. In every single negotiation, whether it's with the kids or with the CEO of the company you're trying to get a contract with, preparation is power. The side that is better prepared achieves significantly better outcomes. Okay, so the majority of our time should be spent before we ever meet with the other party. Many people, unfortunately, decide to skip this step and instead wing it or see how it goes. We're going to show you why that's not the greatest idea. All right, so what are the things that we have to do before we negotiate? I'm going to go through seven steps that you can take uh, to be as prepared as possible for whatever negotiation might throw at you. We're going to go through these seven steps in order, and again, by the end, you're going to have a nice checklist that if you do them well, you'll be well prepared to negotiate. First one we're going to start with is determining your bat knock. And I teased this in the negotiation uh, description of this webinar. So I want to spend a little bit of time here. The word BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, stands for the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Okay, this is not something I created. I want to give credit to Fisher and Yuri from the Harvard Program of Negotiations. This is literally, I'm going to give you some book suggestions later, but one of the best things you can learn. If you stop this webinar, because you have to go for a meeting after this, you're going to be leagues ahead just with this one slide. Okay, so your best alternative to a negotiated agreement is not what you'd like to get. It's not what you think the other side might be willing to give you. It is a real option that you have if you walk away from this negotiation. A BATNA is flexible, it's realistic, and it allows you to walk away more easily. And you may wonder, you may be sitting there going, okay, why is she telling me I want to walk away? I want to get a deal. That's supposed to be the point of what I'm learning today. Well, what I'm going to help you to see is the stronger your option and the greater your ability to be willing to walk away, the less likely, likely you will be to walk away because the more power you're going to have in a negotiation. So when we think about bottom lines, sometimes we go in and we're going to go buy a TV at Best Buy or something like that. And we say, oh, I'm not going to pay over, you know, $1,800. And we just set some number that sounds good for us. It's typically arbitrary. It's very rigid, very often too high because we haven't done our homework. And it kind of backs us into a corner and makes it difficult for us to really understand how to get a good deal with the other side. So our BATNA is going to be something very real. Okay. So when we go in and negotiate a raise with our boss, our BATNA isn't, okay, well, the boss, I'll get them to give me $10 an hour and, you know, more instead of the $18 an hour more I want. No, the BATNA is, I've got another job offer lined up, or here's what I can do on the side to get, you know, more money if that's what I'm looking for. So it's a real option that I could do. It's not made up and it cannot depend on the other party. Your BATNA has to be something that you can do independent of this negotiation. It's your alternative to them. The easier and less costly it is for you to walk away from a negotiation, the better your chances are of succeeding in that negotiation. Keep that in mind, okay? So how do we develop our BATNA? We're gonna start with brainstorming. We're gonna invent a list of actions we could take if no agreement is reached. I always, you know, it's a little morbid, but I always say, what are you going to do if the other side gets hit by a bus or the building that you were going to buy something in burns down? What are you going to do if, okay? So you're going to research that list of options. Um, what are you going to do if the negotiation completely falls apart or they refuse to negotiate with you? What would you do? Put as many crazy things down as you can, and then pick and choose what appear to be the most promising and improve on them. How do I improve on them? Well, I negotiate those as best as I can, okay? And then I'm going to choose the very best. So in the end, I'm going to have one, one option that if this goes south, I'm going to turn and do this instead. So here would be an example, okay? Let's say you're looking to buy furniture. And um, I happen to like Calvin's. I'm not making a plug for anybody, but I happen to like their, their store. 
and I will go in there very often and buy furniture from them for my house. However, before each purchase, I research what I'm looking for, if it's a new dresser or a coffee table or whatever it is, and then I know what all my options are somewhere else. So if I can't buy something there, they don't have what I want, they stop doing business, whatever it is, where am I going to go to get what I want? Then when I go in and talk with them, I understand if the price that they're offering, the discussion we're having is a good option or not. If it seems unfair to me or if it seems too high, I can walk away because I have my, my option, my other idea of where I'm going to buy from very easily. And you may think, oh, well, that means that you're trying to back Calvin's into a corner or whatever. It actually ends up being a very nicer negotiation because you're not bluffing and playing games. You just know what your options are and you're trying to have a nice conversation to get to something better. And if not, you'll walk away. So when we do this, we do the BATNA. One of the things we have to remember, so what is our best alternative is very powerful and important. But what is the other side's best alternative? Can we spend some time to figure that out? If I'm going to buy a car, are car sales really hot right now? Or are car sales, there's lots of cars on the lot and they're desperate for a sale. I need to understand what their alternatives are. And, you know, true story, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, I had to buy a vehicle in the midst of the pandemic when there were no vehicles out there. I don't know if anybody had to do this. You drove around, literally there was not a vehicle on the lot. We finally found one of what we were looking for because the transmission on the other thing blew. I couldn't hold on to that, right? I needed something to drive. And the the salesperson just looked at me and said, okay, here's the price. You know, have it or I'm going to sell it in an hour because somebody's going to walk in and this is the only one in Western New York. And so when you know that, and we did, we searched around everywhere, you knew my BATNA was horrible. <laughs> my BATNA was I'm going to be Ubering for a few months. So it really made me understand where I had to be in this negotiation and honestly understand that what I was getting was the best value I could get because they didn't exist. So you have to take some time to think about what their options are as well. My BATNA, knowing my alternative, is going to prevent me from agreeing to a deal that is bad for me or walking away from a negotiation when my best option is to stay and accept what they are giving me. All right, so let's take a quiz here and see if see if that made sense to you. Back and we are going to take a little quiz. All right. We found a and I got a typo there, but we found a 2022 Ford Mustang at West Her with a sticker price of 24,000. Which of the following might be our BATNA? What is the one thing that might be our best alternative? If you can go ahead and Pick your answer, either one, two, or three. All right. So you've got a couple more coming in. Make your votes. All right, we'll end the poll there and see what the results are. All right, so 23% of you think your best alternative is to get Westward down to 22. 58% of you think the Mustang at Joe Basil. And 19% uh, of you want free oil changes for a year from Westward. Don't we all, right? Um, the actual answer there, and there is a correct answer, is number two, buying a 2021 Mustang from Joe Basil. So our alternative, so in this case, we were negotiating with West Her. So anything that required West Her's involvement can't be our BATNA. It had to be something that was our alternative to West Her. So we go and find something someplace else, and maybe it's, you know, we prefer the 2022, but the 2021 is a really good option. So if that 2022 got bought, you know, before we came back to the dealership to negotiate, what are we going to do? We'll go over to Joe Basil. We kind of like that one for 23. So in this case, we couldn't, you know, even though part of our strategy, we, we might like our target might be to get Westward down to 22. And we might like some free oil changes. Those are good things to strive for. It's not our BATNA. Okay, our BATNA has to be what we can do if West heard we can't do a deal with them. They stop dealing, that car goes away, they burn down, whatever happens. So always think about that with your negotiation is it cannot depend on the party that we have, um, that we're currently negotiating with. All right.
go back and pull. All right, so the next step we're gonna do after we figure out our BATNA is we're gonna try to prioritize the issues, okay? When we have issues in a dispute, okay? They're typically all the things we could be talking about, right? So in the case of the car we just looked at, it could be the price, it could be those oil changes, it could be how quickly the delivery is, it could be, you know, um, I don't know, free mud flaps, whatever it is you might like. There's different things that might be issues. Part of the issue might be speed, part of the issue might be financing. So we want to list all those things out. And you might, it might seem counterintuitive, but in a negotiation, the more issues we have, the better because that gives us things that we can trade, okay? If there's only one issue price, it's a haggle. It's not really negotiation. There's not a lot we can do with that. So for each of the issues that we identify, we wanna look at our optimal outcome, our mid-range outcome, and kind of our bottom lowest, lowest willing uh, that we would take for each issue. We're gonna do that for each side. So we do it for us and we're gonna do it for them, okay? And when you do the chart for the other side, the answers might surprise you. And I'll use a very personal example. I helped one of my sisters years ago as she was going through a divorce. Very concerned about custody and the kids, right? And so we listed out all the different issues in a, in a divorce. And as you can imagine, there's you know financial issues, there's kids issues, there's how we're going to deal with each other issues, there's all kinds of things going on. And what it helped us to see when we listed out the issues for, you know, her soon to be ex, you know, there was more than just the potential for custody that he cared about, right? There were some other things. And it helped us to understand that the full package was what, what was going to be really important in that negotiation. And that in reality, we didn't think full custody was really what he wanted. Right. We were looking at the fact that this is somebody who probably, you know, would prefer to not have to you know, deal with the kids full time. So it helped us to understand what we were actually trying to put together in terms of a package. So you were always looking for trade offs. So what are things if we list the issues for us and the issues for the other side? What trade offs do we see? Is there something that's really important to us, but less important to them that we could trade for something that's more important to them and less important to us? This comes in handy a lot of times when you're negotiating with contractors or you're trying to do a supplier agreement at work, because sometimes time is really more important to one person and cost is important to somebody else. And sometimes there's a trade off you can do. You know, I put my pool in in September because the, the um, contractor wanted to keep his crews busy. September was their less busy season. And for me, I didn't really care at that point. You know, it was fine. I could wait. And I was able to get a lower price, which was important to me at the time. So always trying to think of what those possible trade-offs would possibly be. And you go in with a plan of what you think you might trade. Now, again, in the negotiation itself, that may change as you discover more about the other side, but you at least are ready for most of the possibilities. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is determine some objective standards, okay? Objective standards means we are gonna try to find things that would bolster our position that are objective and we can point to rather than emotional positions. So when we come up with objective standards, it kind of takes the um, independent will, so to speak, the emotion out of it from both sides. And it helps make it easier for us to deal with the other side. So every issue that we have, we want to frame as a search, joint search for an objective criteria. So if somebody says to you, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I want 13,000. You say, okay, why do you feel, what data do you have that shows that 13,000 is the appropriate number? I, I, I'm interested. I'd like to hear about that. And very often, you know, the answer is, well, that's what I want. And it's because, and it makes it really tough for them to continue down that process um, and not look like they're being unreasonable. So we want to have fair standards. They want, they should be things that are legitimate and practical. So we can do things like market value, precedent, tradition, reciprocity. All of those are possible objective standards. We want to ask questions in the negotiation. How did you arrive at that figure? What's your basis for that number? Okay. When we're, we have pressure on the other side to accept their number or their resolution to a particular issue, not necessarily a number, we want to say, okay, explain why they think that is fair. What are the criteria that you're using? Here's one that I'm using and why is that appropriate, okay? So we really want to make it a fair and just process. 
So when we're buying a house, okay, let's say we're the purchaser and the seller has a market price or a sticker price, if you want, for the for the house of 200000 What are some of the objective criteria we could use, right? So we might be able to go and, you know, find other sales. We might be able to go and talk about, you know, repairs that need to be done. We might be able to look at appraisals. We might be looking at assessments. All of those would be objective criteria. And when we have objective criteria and the other side has objective criteria, it becomes a discussion about which one is more applicable rather than an emotional back and forth. It really does help make this a joint problem solving discussion rather than us versus them kind of discussion. So when we ask for a raise, we go into our boss and say, you know, I'd like to get $10,000 more, right? And the boss would like to not give you $10,000 more. <laughs> that might be the positions that we're at. Okay, well, why is 10000 important to you? Or why does that make sense? Well, if you've done your homework, you can look at the market value of your job. You can point to another offer you have that's $10,000 more. You can point to parity, um, you know, market ranges. Right now in, in uh, New York State, it's pretty easy with the pay transparency law, right? You can look at what other people are being offered um, in similar positions at a starting level. You can look at what other people in your company are making. So you have a lot more um, information and objective information to base it on. All right, so we're going to test and see if you've been listening with one more quiz here. All right. All right, so we are going, we are going to buy a new home, okay? Which of the following do you think would be objective criteria we could use? Okay, so our options are the list price of the house, the seller's offer, the price of a recent sale on the same street, or the amount you'd like to pay. Which one of those sounds like an objective criteria? All right, I think we got. Uh, let's see. All right, I think we got most of the folks in. We'll go ahead and end that poll and share the results. And boy, you guys were paying attention. So 95% of you got the right answer there. The price of a recent sale on the same street. Okay, the list price is just the sticker. The seller made that up. Uh, they might have been based on objective criteria, but we don't know that. That's just the same as a sticker when you walk in, right? We don't know what that's based on. The seller's offer, if you if they said, okay, well, I'd be willing to take this. That's not objective because I don't know what it's based on. I can't point to that being a fair and objective price, okay? So think about when we're buying anything where there's public information about it, and that very often is cars, homes, bigger purchases. We can get some idea of praise values, what it's selling for on eBay, similar products. We can look at listings in the real estate um, section of the Buffalo News to see what similar houses have sold at. So lots of opportunities for us to get some objective things. Then when we sit down and have the debate, it's an objective debate. It's a much, much lower temperature discussion of here's why I think this is fair. OK, and then you start debating why their criteria might be better or your criteria. But at least at that point, you're not just you know yelling back and forth and haggling over and over. All right, so once we've determined our objective criteria, we're going to talk about people issues, okay? Now, we're doing all this, remember, before the negotiation. So before the negotiation, during our preparation phase, our job is to understand what might be issues with the people that we're going to negotiate with. Remember, you don't negotiate with companies. You negotiate with people. So you need to understand what the positions are of the people and what, what they're doing. So who are they? What's their background? What do I need to know? Okay. One of the questions we always ask is what is the existing relationship? So for the existing relationship, um, will it affect the negotiation? If this is somebody you're emotionally entangled with, that can get really tough. I mentioned the divorce one. Boy, if you're trying to negotiate with a soon-to-be ex, whew, there's no more <laughs> emotional negotiation than that, right? Um, and that, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you, you don't have to negotiate, but that may be where you need a third party involved, okay? Maybe if it's something where you know this person gets under your skin, maybe you're not the lead negotiator for your company, or maybe even in, in the case of a, a husband-wife thing, maybe if it's something that you don't feel comfortable doing, you ask your spouse or a friend to help you out in the negotiation. So think about that ahead of time. 
Look at the power and authority issues. Is this somebody who can control your future? Is it somebody who seems to have more expertise? Is there a way that you feel um, not on the level playing field? And is there a way to make you feel a little more on the level, level playing field? What have you heard about them? Remember, this is Buffalo. Like the six degrees of separation doesn't apply here. We're at about two. So dig into them a little bit and find out, you know, it always helps when you start a negotiation to be personal and establish a relationship. So let's try to learn about them. And maybe we have something in common and know some of the same people. That always helps us set a little bit more trust and make negotiations a little more, um, uh, less of a power struggle and more of a comfortable exchange, okay? Try to think of the extenuating, extenuating circumstances. So your negotiators are people too. They have stuff, like we all have stuff. They have things going on in their lives. So do you know something about them? Is there a recent death, an illness? Is their job on the line? Is the outcome of this negotiation? Are they really upset with you from something that happened earlier that you need to deal with? What are the circumstances that might impact this negotiation that maybe you could clean up or clear up um, ahead of it? What are the possible tricks and tactics that they might try? So think a little bit about you know, either if you've negotiated with them in the past or if you've heard something about them, what are the things that you need to be prepared for that they might try? So whenever possible, we want to try to establish a relationship, okay? We negotiate better. We're typically more successful with people we like, okay? And if we have an ongoing relationship. So you want to have that small talk with the salesperson, take a client out to dinner, you know, try to meet and, and greet people that you're going to be negotiating with. In some cultures like the Japanese, they won't even talk about a negotiated price until they've had an extensive social kind of interaction ahead of time. It would be rude to do so. So make sure um, when you're dealing with people issues. So we're trying to establish a relationship. We're trying to do all this. In advance, one of the things we also have to understand is if the person you are supposed to be negotiating with has the authority to make the deal, okay? If not, you should try not to negotiate with them, okay? This is the car dealership. Think about, I have to go check with the boss in the back. I don't know if there's ever anybody actually in the back or not, but does the person that you're negotiating with have the authority to make the deal? Otherwise, any deal that you reach is contingent on them going to ask somebody else. And then you have, you you might be asked to give up yet something else. Um, whenever possible, you want to try to deal directly with the person who is in the authority to make a decision. So that's where you want to find out in advance and try to set it up that way. And if you can't, at least go in knowing that anything that you're doing is not a set deal. All right. Also in advance, before we've ever gotten to meet with the other party, we're going to try to construct multiple deals. Okay, Fisher and Yuri that I pointed out before call this yesable propositions. So we're trying to come up with a deal that we think would be good for us and good for them. And you might say, well, I don't want to spend a lot of time coming up with something good for them. I don't care. I don't, I'm not dealing with them. Well, you want a deal and they're not going to, they're not going to say yes, if it's not good for them. So you want to try to come up with things, put yourself in their position and try to come up with things that would be good for them. You know, we, we use the term in negotiating all the time, step into their shoes for a few minutes in preparation, pretend you're them and look at what you're presenting to them. Is there any way they can say yes? Sometimes the answer is pretty quickly, oh, no, I couldn't say yes if I were them. So I better come up with something different, okay? So we don't want something, you know, we don't want to go out there and look like we haven't even considered them because that's a rude negotiation. We want to go in trying to come up with a deal that's good for both. As we're brainstorming these possible deals, um, either with ourselves or with someone who's helping us prep for a negotiation, you know, brainstorm, no criticism, list all the ideas, and again, improve upon the most um, promising. We want to try to do what we call expanding the pie. And in negotiating, what expanding the pie is, is finding things that are good for both of you. So maybe we have different interests that we can dovetail. So in other words, maybe I am, um, you know, I am more risk averse than the other side. So I do something that requires taking more risk than they do. And that's okay with me. And it, it certainly helps them. Um, maybe there are things, again, that are low cost to me, but high benefit to them that I could offer in exchange. Maybe a contingency agreement would work. Okay, so maybe we get um, we get a lower price by agreeing to lock in a few contract, a longer term contract. And then they've got stability of income and revenue. We've got the lower price. That would be an example of something that's good for both of us. So these yesable propositions, think in advance about whether you or the other side, you could say yes. We want to make their choice to agree with us as painless as possible. And remember, don't assume that if you win, they must lose. 
If you walk away from a negotiation and both sides feel that they won, you've done your job. You haven't left money on the table. You've done your job. Okay. The other thing um, step we have to take in preparation is looking at the physical environment. And this may seem a little silly, but it is very true. We tend to negotiate better on our home field. Okay. So maybe we want to have the discussion in our office rather than the boss's office. Or maybe we want to uh, go to the company um, or have them come to us if it's a contractor that we're negotiating with or something else. So we want to negotiate wherever we feel most comfortable if possible. If if not, okay, we have to think about the physical environment and understand whether the meeting place is designed to be disadvantageous to us for some reason, okay? So are they setting up a negotiation for 11 o'clock when they've seen your calendar and know you have a really important meeting at 12 o'clock and you might be inclined to get it over with so that you're not late to that meeting? You want to make sure that you really think about you know, the actual act of negotiating, where it is, what the time is, what the environment looks like. If for some reason this doesn't look um, like it's doable to you, so they're putting you in a position where you feel uncomfortable, then it's time to actually negotiate about the negotiation, which is a whole nother process, right? So we're going to start thinking about the beginning of a negotiation before we get to the negotiation. And we're going to talk to the other side and say, Hey, I understand that you'd like to meet in your office and I prefer you meet at, at yours or at mine, but could we maybe have a neutral position? We meet at a coffee shop and discuss so that we're both comfortable or whatever it is, but think about what they are. Um, and we, we could spend a whole day talking about tricks and tactics. And I actually do a, a part two to this, if you're interested sometime uh, where we talk about kind of what are the things that people try to do in a negotiation that aren't so win-win uh, and yes, yes, and how do we uh, be prepared to combat that and turn it around to a win-win? Um, because some people haven't taken this seminar and they don't know that you can actually be a good, conscientious, moral negotiator and get a really good deal at the same time. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so that was a very quick rundown of our preparation, okay? As we leave the preparation and get into the negotiation phase of this discussion, I want you to remember, if you only remember one thing, your BATNA is your single most valuable piece of information in any negotiation. Spend the most time trying to come up with your alternative. And this, you know, I, I said in the prelude to this negotiation seminar that this can apply to your teenagers. OK, well, think about it. What is your alternative to whatever they're asking? What can you do? You know, it, deal with a sullen teenager because you said no. Is they you can handle that? That's fine. Give in, and that might be your best alternative. What is it that you can do with them uh, that will allow you to, you know, I won't say have power because that that kind of doesn't sound good in a negotiation with your kids, but to understand their side and their point of view. So think about your BATNA, your alternatives, and really think about theirs. Okay, because that really helps frame how you're going to negotiate, what you're going to do, and how to get to an agreement in advance before you start negotiating. You should have a list of potential agreements that you think will be great for them and great for you. That's the goal when you walk out of this preparation stage. All right, so now you've done that and we move into the negotiation itself. We've prepared and hopefully um, we're ready to go. Um, so the first step in a negotiation should be to set a friendly and cooperative tone. Again, if you're a good negotiator, that whole playing games and bluffing and doing all that, that's usually the sign of somebody who thinks they're a good negotiator, not somebody who actually is a good negotiator. So if you are willing to get good deals and be willing to negotiate with people time and time again, we want to be friendly and cooperative. And again, sometimes it doesn't materialize that that's the outcome, okay, and we'll learn how to deal with that. But that's certainly our intent. That's our goal every time. So we want to have the focus of our negotiation be on two parties coming together to solve a problem jointly rather than confrontation, okay? That is our goal. So how are we gonna do this? Well, first, during the negotiation process, we're gonna try to determine what interests are underlying their position, okay? Their position is what they're saying to you, okay? I want X, I want this, okay? That's gonna be their position. We're trying to determine what are the interests that underlying that position. For every interest, there are usually several positions that could satisfy it, okay? Um, interests are the needs, desires, concerns, and fears that motivate you. A position is what you decide on because of those interests, okay? 
Um, so for example, let's say you're Julia Roberts agent and you came into a negotiation demanding 20 million for a picture, that's her position, okay? Her interest is what underlies that position. When you identify interests, you may be able to see deals that would make you both better off than you both thought possible, okay? These are the win-win negotiations. So we're gonna come up with common interests and find agreements that are good for both sides. If we have differing interests, that's good too, because those are things we could then trade. Okay, I'm gonna give you your last quiz of the seminar here and see how you like interests. Oops, all right, we are going to, all right. All right, so here's our last poll. Micah Hyde, okay? And please forgive me if you're a True Bills fan and I screwed up on what a good million dollar uh, payment would be, but Micah Hyde wants a $15 million contract with the Buffalo Bills for 2024. Which of the following is likely not, so notice the not, the interest behind his position of 15 million? So why is Micah Hyde's agent asking for 15 million and not 14 or not 10 or not 22? Why is 15 million the choice that he is making? So pick your answer there. So again, we are looking for which is not an interest that might be behind the 15 million. This is, I know I'm a teacher. I normally don't like to do negative polls, but this one makes a point. So which of the one, which of the following is not an interest behind his $15 million position. All right, I think we got most everybody jumped on there. Let's get a couple more coming in. All right, I think you guys are paying attention. So $15 million from Micah Hyde, okay? He wants, might want recognition as the top safety for the build. I think 15 million would do that, but I'm not positive, okay? Um, he wants to feel value. He wants to parity with the other top safeties in the league because that's what everybody says. He's the top paid quarterback, top paid safety. And then he needs 15 million to live, to afford to live in Buffalo. Well, I don't think that's truly the case. So when you realize that, okay, and you say, well, wait a minute, 15 million, that number doesn't have any particular weight to it as a number. What has the weight is what's behind that number. So if I recognize that maybe what Micah Hyde really wants is this recognition or a show of value or something else, then maybe there's other ways if I can't do 15 million, maybe there's other things now I can talk to him about. And look at, I, I think the example, you know, Tom Brady, when he was at the Patriots, he wasn't the top paid quarterback in the league, but certainly they showed his value and they tried to explain, right? Or I think he tried to make it uh, so that the cap space was available for the other people that would help him win more Super Bowls, which would help him be known as the greatest of all time, right? So what is it for Micah Hyde that would have that value? Is it a longer term contract so he knows that they're investing in him? Is it the ability to, um, you know, have some say in how the plays are called or whatever it is they do? Is it some recognition where people say good things about him and talk about him and restructure his contract so that the value is clear? Those are the kinds of discussions that now we have something to talk about. If, the, if 15 million is his number, and we don't know anything about interest and we just assume 15 million is hard and fast and we can't afford 15 million. Now, all of a sudden we're backed into a corner and we don't have anything to talk to them about, okay? So coming up with those interests behind are really, really important. All right, nice job on our last poll. All right, so once we've identified those interests and we're trying to think of those trade-offs, in the negotiation process, one of the most important things we can do is practice active listening, okay? Discussing and discovering shared interests requires that you listen, okay? You have to be an active listener. Really listening to the other side rather than thinking about what you're gonna say next can help you identify potential deals and make the other side feel valued, okay? In customer service situations, sometimes this is all the other side wants, to be heard and understood. Okay, reiterate what the other side said, tell them what you think they meant to make sure you got it right, ask questions to determine their interests. 
summarize and restate. Okay, if I think if I hear you correctly, then making sure this is done in time for your party that the lawn looks great is the most important thing that you really care about. Am I getting that right? Okay, okay, if I've heard you correctly, you know, price per unit is what's really most important to you because you've got a goal set by your boss or whatever it is. Okay. So as we're doing this listening, in order to listen, our mouths have to be closed. <laughs> and that's hard for a lot of us that like to talk, right? But we want to be able to hear what they are saying and get the other side talking. When we're talking, we're not learning. When they're talking, we are learning. Okay, so we want to utilize silence. If there's one thing that, that borders on a trick that I'm going to share with you, it is being comfortable and able to utilize silence in a negotiation. Most of us are ingrained to be uncomfortable with silence and seek to fill it, okay? In a negotiation, this can lead to the other side giving you more information than what they intended. If you are the one filling the silence, you may give away more information than you intended, and you might make concessions to fill the silence. We've seen that. Somebody says, hey, you know, you're standing at a garage sale trying to buy something, and you, you look at, you know, the cookie jar you're trying to buy, and you say, hey, would you take $20? And the other side doesn't say something right away. And you're like, well, would you take 25? And all of a sudden, you just negotiated against yourself. And the other side didn't even have to say a word, right? Um, because you were uncomfortable with silence. When you make an offer or state your position, pause and wait for the other side's response, okay? The more you are quiet, the more the other side will talk and you may learn something valuable. This is, I swear to God, works in all kinds of situations. When you're talking with your kids, ask them a question and then be quiet and see if they'll start talking. I do this even with my own kids who don't always talk so much, right? You be quiet and let them get uncomfortable and start answering to you or explaining why this is important to them or explaining the situation. Ask good questions and then wait for the answer. Utilize silence. In general, okay, when we have a good feeling about what the other side really wants, and we're ready to begin working towards a settlement. In general, I would recommend that you not make the initial offer. There are some circumstances where it's a good idea, but in general, not a good idea, okay? Unless you are very, very certain of where the other side is at, you risk either insulting them or experiencing the winner's curse, which is where they say yes really fast and you realize that maybe you didn't do your homework and you could have gotten a better deal, et cetera. Um, if you've ever gone somewhere and offered, you know, a, a price quickly, gone to a flea market and tried to buy that cookie jar and you say, would you take 20? They're like, yeah, oh, great. And you're like, shoot, I should have said 15. You know, that's an example of the winner's curse. So we want to avoid that. So um, what we want, if the other side makes the initial first offer, you can see how far apart or close together you are, how that relates to all the homework that you've done about what your BATNA is and what you're willing to accept. And you know whether you're in the ballpark or not and what the negotiation in front of you looks like. If their offer is completely unacceptable and it's out of your ballpark, you want to counter that offer immediately and re-anchor the discussion around your proposal. So you want to get that off the table and go back to what you feel is more valid and more reasonable than what they suggest. So sometimes people will throw a really crazy number out there because they hope you'll meet in the middle and the middle is actually higher than what you should agree to. So don't fall for that, okay? Re-anchor with whatever you feel is more reasonable and start negotiating from that if you can. All right, in the general as well in the negotiation process, kind of a cardinal rule, is you never give something up without getting something in return. So no, don't negotiate against yourself. When you give concessions, make sure you're giving them psychological value. Okay. Too often people make a proposal that the other side doesn't immediately jump on and then they try to sweeten the deal. If you've got an offer on the table, wait for the other side to respond and present a counteroffer. If they ask for something, don't just say yes, if, even if you think you're okay with it, but ask for something in return. This not only gets you more, but it gives more psychological value to what you gave the other side. They want to feel good about the deal. And if you say yes too quickly, they go back with the winner's curse and don't feel good about the negotiation. So you want to make sure it seems like both sides are winning, okay? 
This rule also helps you avoid getting taken in the 11th hour when someone proposes something just as a way to end the process if you do just one more thing, okay? You won't do one more thing unless they do one more thing. Make sure it's always fair, okay? In a negotiation, do not let your emotions get the best of you. Recognize that there will be emotions on both sides, and sometimes you're going to need to let the other side vent before you can work towards a constructive settlement. Sometimes you might feel yourself losing control. Take a break. That is not a sign of defeat. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, I'm feeling emotional and out of control. I need a break. You can just say, I need to use the restroom or I have to go get a drink of water or something. Clear your mind. Analyze what's going on. Slow down the pace. Okay. Breaks are very important. Utilize them. Do not feel bad about it. Walk away, come back to it. Understand the emotions and try to control yours. This is where sometimes bringing along somebody for support can be helpful, especially if you know certain things are hot button issues to you. Bring someone along who might be less inclined to be emotional or get upset about things. Okay, so remember, emotions are normal. Okay, you're going to feel them, anticipate them, and then deal with them as they come up. Okay, so we've gone through kind of the process of negotiation. There is a very important step three, and that is the outcome, okay? So the outcome, when we're, we think we're near the end, we are going to accept the deal, okay, that's on the table. How do we know when to accept it, okay? If we've done your homework, this is easy. We should only accept an agreement if it's better than our BATNA, okay? If we don't seem to have the possibility of reaching an agreement, superior to your next best alternative, then you're better off taking your BATNA. At that point, you walk away without an agreement. You have not failed, okay? Failing to reach an agreement is not failing. You've simply chosen a better alternative. Your BATNA is better, so you're going to take it, okay? So this ensures that you will not make a settlement that you're later gonna regret or feel like you got taken in a negotiation, okay? So when you're, you know, your goal is to do significantly better than your BATNA, but you need to know that in order to beat it. And you need to know when, obviously, in discussion with the other side, that's not going to happen. So your best alternative is really great, and you're going to have to go pick that. So we always want to work on improving our best alternative as much as possible. Don't go into your boss and ask for a raise, take it or leave it, if you don't have another job offer lined up. Okay, that's got to be a, a real BATNA that you need to have in that situation. Once you're done negotiating and you hopefully have a deal or you've walked away and taken your BATNA, take time, take a few minutes and reflect on how it went. Where could you have been better prepared? Where did something happen in the negotiation that you don't think you reacted to as best you can? What were some things that worked really well that you should keep in mind? So evaluate those so that you can see what could I have done differently next time and how can I continuously improve my negotiation skills? So, you know, just like anything else, you want to constantly be getting better as a negotiator. It is not a, oh, I'm good, now I'm all done. It is something that is constantly evolving and skills that are constantly increasing. All right. So, wow, in, in a short amount of time, we went through all those stops and stages in a negotiation process. Um, one of the things before we turn it over to Q&A, I just want to mention a little bit about the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership since I'm here and I'm the executive director. If you have any questions about our programs, uh, go to management.buffalo.edu slash CEL and come check them out. We are we exist to support small business owners and help them with their um, their business growth, with their needs, with scaling. Uh, lots of things we have going on. So feel free if you're in that group to come and uh, talk to me. We'd love to support you. If you love talking about negotiations and you're moving from the root canal into like, hey, maybe I could do this. Here's some suggestions for more. Okay. These are books that are absolutely um, excellent that you can get, you know, you can get them on the free library app or you can um, grab them from Amazon. Uh, getting to Yes and Getting Past No from the folks at Harvard, Never Split the Dis Difference by Chris Voss. He's an excellent, he's got a whole bunch of books. They're awesome and, and uh, webinars and everything else. So in summary, before I take the Q&A, you can get what you want and be a fair negotiator at the same time. By focusing your energy on preparation and really understanding the other side's interest, you increase the likelihood of reaching an agreement that is better for you both. You also will build a solid relationship with the other party and feel comfortable with negotiating with them again in the future. If you've done your job and you see the other side at Wegmans, you shouldn't hide behind the soup cans or anything else and feel like you can't talk to them. It should be a great relationship. 
go up and say hi, and you should be ready to go negotiate with that person again in the future. Okay, so at this time, I want to open it up to your questions. Susan, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Um, I really, truly appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And for these resources, these book suggestions, we'll make sure we get those in the follow-up email uh, to everyone as well. So thank you for that um, information. So Susan, just to get started on the Q&A. So just taking a look, um, this first question, when we are negotiating with our boss for a raise, how can we treat them as a person and not the company when their goal is to protect the company interest? Good, good point. Uh, well, they are people and not the company. So one of the things to know is how have they behaved in past situations for you? So do they tend to be like in meetings? Are they always asking you for the data or are they very emotional and do things kind of on the fly? You know, what is that person like? What, what do you see them focusing on. One of the key things I like to find out if you're negotiating with a boss is how are they measured by their boss? So if you know um, everything is about sales, let's say they, you know, meeting their sales quota, then when you're asking for a raise, you want to show how with this increased level of pay responsibility, what you've done to contribute towards, you know, increasing revenue, which helps them. So you think about them. If your boss is somebody who, you know, always seems harassed and never enough hours in the day and has such a big job, in exchange for asking for a raise, is there something you could take off their plate? So that's part of understanding them. Could you say like, listen, you know, I know you're normally, um, you know, uh, setting the agenda for our staff meeting and, you know, I'm trying to move up in this organization. I'd like the chance to get exposure to more senior level tasks. Can I run the task that, you know, set the agenda, take that off of you and, you know, really show that I'm trying to increase in, in exchange for this raise, you know? So you're trying to think of things, you know, even though a boss's job is to protect the interests of the company, the boss is also trying to make their lives easier. So what can you do that would make their life easier? What can you propose or how can you show what you've done that it will or if how bad leaving would be on that? OK, not that you want to be threatening, but you want to make it understand like I really want to stay. I value the team, but I have this you know, competing offer that's pretty attractive. However, or I understand what my market value is, and here's why I want to contribute to the value of the team. Here's what I can do. So you always want, you don't want to go in and say, I need more money because I'd like to take more vacations. You know, it's, I need more money, and here's the things I'm going to do for you that make it a no-brainer. You know, here's what I can do to increase either your efficiency, the company's efficiency, whatever that is. So for sure. Excellent, Susan. Thank you. I'm going to maybe combine two questions here, kind of similar, I think. So um, or they can be, um, you can kind of piggyback off one. Um, so the first part of it, part A, wondering about not making the first offer. Doesn't it set ex expectations low, like you're lowballing? And then maybe part two of that, how do you handle salary negotiations when there is that field on the application that requests the desired salary? Oh, yeah, I love that field. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, the two, two things, two parts to that, okay? Um, low balling is not principled negotiation, right? So if you set a low expectation, you run the risk of somebody saying, oh, we're not even in the same league, I'm out of there. And they might just walk away and say, we're done with it. Um, it, it it's, a, it's a risky trick to low ball somebody because your danger is that they're gonna say, you know, this isn't even, you know, in the realm of feasibility. That doesn't mean you go in with your highest possible, right? So if they, if you are in the position where you have to make the first offer because you're both staring at each other, you know, playing a game of chicken, then you're going to do something based on your research. So if it's a low number that you can point to a good rationale and objective criteria for, that's fine. That's where I would start. So I'd say, well, you know, I have this other one over here at this price that I like this house, this car, this you know, other supplier, whatever it is. Um, however, I'd really like to do business with you. So you tell me, what can you do? You know, but I wouldn't go in throwing some artificial fake lowball number out. I think that's going to get you known as a disingenuous negotiator and it might work once, but then you're, you're never going to negotiate with them again. Um, in terms of the field on the application, New York State in a weird way just made that a lot easier because essentially the pay transparency law when you're applying for a job just said they made the first offer. So now that's your starting point. And now you can counter if you want. 
Okay, so you can now have a discussion, again, based on knowing what the market is and everything else. So in that field, you know, you want, obviously, if you say your required salary is exactly what they're offering, you know what that number is going to end up. So if your required salary is at the top range of that scale, or maybe a little bit about, like, if they give you a scale and they say this job is 70 to 80,000, and you put in there your requested salary is 90, well, maybe they know they're going to talk to you down to 80 or whatever. But the danger you run into, and, and I've had this happen with people we've been looking at hire, their, their required number that they put down is so far outside our range, I don't even interview them because I know I can't make them happy. So you have to have that number be something real to you that you can get somewhere else. Okay, you want to set, you want to re-anchor, you want to set an expectation, but most of the time, those salary ranges that are published, that's what they have to work with. You know, it, in some cases, they can go a little bit above, but typically not tens of thousands above. So you have to be careful there. All right. Thank you for that advice there, Susan. Um, this next question, um, would you maybe be able to just expand upon um, and provide an example of negotiation as it pertains to managing those multiple job offers that we receive? Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful position to be in, right? Um, so when you, so let's say you're looking for, you're, you're going to leave your current place and you've, you know, gone out there and you're on a job hunt or you're already unemployed, you know, out of your last job and you're looking for a new one and you have several different companies. First thing you have to do, right, is start yourself a little spreadsheet with what is involved in each. So, you know, which one's in better proximity to your home, which one offers you some more flexible arrangements, how much vacation, how much pay, the full package, the benefits associated, as much as you can find out at that stage on each of those companies that you're looking at and start yourself off a spreadsheet and have a discussion with yourself or with, you know, partners or family, depending on what's involved, about which of those are most important to you, okay? A lot of times nowadays, it is not about that salary. I mean, salary is important, but flexibility is becoming one of the most uh, requested kind of benefits that people receive. And, you know, health insurance, if you get it through um, somewhere else, then maybe that's less important to you right now. So put all of those down into a column, right? And then take the, the offer, like maybe there's one that sets with you, like oh, this is the one I would really like to go to, but it's not as much as this one. So take, you know, pick, pick which ones are your favorite and then take your number two favorite. Okay. And try to start negotiating with that company, with the recruiter. And it, I swear to God, it can be as simple as when you talk to the HR person at that company saying, I'm sorry, what is it that you can do? Um, is there anything that can be done on the vacation? Because it's a little lower than I expected. And then just be quiet and see. They will often have the ability to give you extra vacation time just like that before you even do anything. So, like That's one that people do not negotiate that is crazy because I've seen it work um, so easily and instantly in many cases that that's a crazy one. So anyhow, you're starting to negotiate number two and get that package to look as attractive as possible. Okay. So, hmm, okay, here's the, I got the salary up a little bit. I got more vacation. I got this. And now go back to your number one and start that negotiation. So you have a number two that you really like, that sounds really good, but number one, you really, really like. So now you're going to start your negotiation with number one, having this great number two ready to go. OK, and that's what I mean by figure out all your options, improve upon what you think the best ones are. And then, you know, you've got your BATNA, the best alternative. You got these other alternatives still, but your best alternative is this one, number two, and then go and negotiate with number one. If you can't get number one to be better than number two, boop, you take number two and you're all good. Fantastic. Susan, thank you so much. I know we're at the top of the hour um, and we've had some great questions and some continue to come in, but um, we are just after uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we are going to just wrap things up for the day. And I just want to say thank you so much, Susan, for giving us your time, again, sharing your expertise with us. Um, it has been a true pleasure. As a reminder, we have recorded today's session. We're going to send you all a copy within the next 24 hours. So you do have that as well. And then our webinar Wednesday series will continue next week. So more information and registration will be shared in the follow-up email. But Susan, I do want to turn it over to you. Um, we see some nice um, thank you messages coming through as well. So um, just want to turn it over to you for any closing remarks. Yes, thank you all so much, Andrew. It's been in this time for you. If there's any questions we didn't get to or you think of a question when you leave, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to have a chat about negotiating anytime. It's a fun subject. SCSteffa at buffalo.edu.
Um, or you can find us on the website for CEL under the UB website. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help you with it. Perfect. And Perfect. we will include all that tomorrow as well. Um, we'll make sure we get Susan's email and the web address too for uh, the CEL. So thank you all again for joining us. Take care, stay well, enjoy the rest of your day in Go Bulls. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you.